glimpse of activities. Let me take a few minutes to give a glimpse of activities and initiatives taken by the departments to offer maximum encouragement to students who enter into the portals of Alpha. The college was started in the year 1996 with four departments, commerce, electronics, biochemistry, and microbiology. And over the years, it has grown to nine undergraduate departments and two postgraduate departments. The college is permanently affiliated to the University of Madras. Advisory board was constituted to monitor the progress made by the departments, launching new projects, exploring new avenues of industry academic confluence, and exchange of know-how between different institutions. Innovative ideas to offer short-term courses to interested students were also conceived. The outcome of the ideas proposed by the advisory board enters into the realization of the certificate courses and value-added courses. The department encourages compulsory internships in the sophomore year, which helps them to receive certificates from various reputed organizations and industries. Academic pursuits are interwoven with serious hands-on tasks to exhibit a wholesome understanding of the subject. The youngsters are induced to involve in projects which enhances in-depth knowledge in the subject and a plethora of insights for future research. These projects will eventually be exhibited to the school students as well as to college students. The criterion of consultancy has been carried out with the MOUs entered with various organizations and industries like National Institute of Electronics and Information Technology, Computer Society of India, Pantacroy Private Limited, etc. The outcome of the MOUs in the past helped the students to get real-time experience in the industry and eventually has emerged as IoT-enabled laboratories with signature display boards. The academic environment consists of a large, valid early classrooms, spacious laboratories, production studios with state-of-art, workshops to promote research activity. To keep them physically fit, a gymnastic center has been established. The library cheerfully harbors more than 17,000 books with the added facility of a digital library. The departments have separate libraries to quench the students' curious minds with the area of books. The consequences of the teaching pedagogies adopted by the departments are reflected in the results obtained in the university examinations. The college proudly honors the gold medalists of Alpha. Every department produces a good number of university ranks since its inception. Ascending in any academic platform involves a lot of steps that evolves from the effort and enthusiasm in searching, learning, and sharing of knowledge. Towards this pursuit, we at Alpha never fail to include seminars, workshops, symposiums, field visits, conferences, etc. in our agenda. The multifarious activities and some of the milestones achieved in the past are brought forth here. Seminars by erudite personalities from various academic institutions and industries are invited periodically to enhance and upgrade their knowledge in various fields of interest. The special talks delivered by Mr. PWC Davidar IAS, Mr. Freddy Philip IPS, professors from IIT, scientists from IGCAR, National Institute of Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India, and industry experts are noteworthy. To impart practical knowledge and to gain industry exposure, field trips and real-time training from leading industries are made mandatory. The theory classes are to be intertwined with flexible learning process. Workshop is one such method that helps students to develop practical skills within the relevant field. To bring in the essence of research among the student community, national and international conferences are conducted. Students are encouraged to write research articles. Conference proceedings will be released with ISBN number. Best poster and oral presenters are honored with awards. To inculcate the skills of creative writing, editing, publishing, and marketing, in-house journals are published annually. The placement cell of the college offers professional training to all the job aspirants in the areas of technical skills, personality enrichment, and communication through training programs, mock interviews, group discussions, etc. Communication laboratory is set up to enhance the speaking skills of the students. We are proud to say that our students are placed in well-reputed organizations 
in India and across the world. Alumni Sen is given priority in the academic environment. Their career experience is shared through seminars, interaction with the students. We take immense pleasure in showcasing our prominent alumni who are well placed and settled across the world. The students are engaged during the lockdown period due to COVID-19 through online activities. Classes are handled through Google and Zoom. Encouraged to enroll in MOOC and NP NPTEL courses and also to attend webinars. Placement trainings are also offered through online. With the excellent infrastructure and a team of very qualified and experienced staff, we ensure the students to meet the portals of Alpha well equipped with the necessary skills to fit them into the highly competent global market and also to serve the community at large. Thank you for patiently listening to the presentation. Over to Dr. Shibliya. Thank you, Vinitama. Good evening. Let me start with the divine words of Tirupura. Kannodiyar endavan kattu mugatthirindu kunnodiyar kalladavan. The learned are said to have eyes, but the unlearned have two souls in their face. Whatever may be the family situation, the calamities around us, until life and earth, there is no end to education and learning in your school. As online learning becoming the new normal, being at Alpha Arts and Science College, under the leadership of Blaise Jordan, pioneers in being first to get it right by linking innovation to the Gandhi and have conducted and are conducting many webinars, online sessions for the benefit of the students. I'm Dr. Shibriya Marjala, on behalf of my husband and staff at the Arts and Science College, welcome you all to this much awaited trending topic in the industry. Like you, I'm also very much excited to learn more from these industry experts. It's my great honor and privilege to welcome these speakers from the industry. Mr. Krishna V, Cloud Architect at Microsoft Canada. Experienced Cloud Architect with the deep skills in database and data center management, free sales and business development. He has been associated with the Microsoft for more than 16 plus years of now. He has played different roles and positions in Microsoft and has won many endorsements and a go to person because of his strong technical skills. We also take a special privilege in introducing Jaya Matthew. She comes with a sound industry experience across multiple domains. She is currently working as a senior data scientist at Microsoft Canada. She has worked in multiple geographies in Australia, Canada, India, and USA with cross functional teams spanning across the world. She is very passionate about her learning and sharing her knowledge. It's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Sub Mali. Director of Technology, Tristosport. He's a data scientist and worked with multiple clients on digital transformation. And is happy to share his experience and knowledge to us today. So, with no further wait, let me pass on the control to our three wonderful speakers. So, what to you, Mr. Krishna? He's about 91% uh, growth in terms of 91% uh, of the companies are looking to use. AI in some shape or form. This is a latest report from the Gartner. Uh, um, and of that, and also a lot of the enterprises uh, have started using AI significantly, which is around 37%. But if you see, okay, these are from the industry perspective, but where are the key challenges? You know, where does the challenge lies is the, is the lack of skills, you know? So which means uh, not many people know about, uh, about this AI and ML uh, side of technology, both from the business perspective and technology perspective. And the second one is a lot of enterprises don't know what to define an AI strategy. To give an example, if you're, if you're an industry which have been manufacturing for say 100 years or 50 years, uh, you don't, if, you're, if you don't know how to take advantage of the, say for example, the predictive maintenance model or how to service your customer, you know, those sort of things, if it's not, companies don't have an idea of how to build a strategy. Um, and also use cases, you know what, okay, if you're a large industry, uh, let's say manufacturing or financial industry, uh, you don't know which areas I should uh, implement uh, AI. So that's where you students come into play where uh, you have the opportunity uh, to get more knowledge on these uh, areas and then you can be the thought leaders as well as uh, practitioners 
of AI and ML so that you can change the industries that you're going to work with. If you take about, uh, okay, so that's a generic overview on the industry. Uh, where are the transformations happening? Uh, the first one is uh, uh, digital agents. You know, what we, by, what we mean by digital agents is, uh, think about uh, interacting with the customers, you know, and employees. Uh, for example, uh, uh, if few years, still a few years ago, uh, if you want to order a product, uh, if you want to buy something, you need to go to a physical store, and then you need to place the order and then buy it over the counter. But in today's day and age, as you know, you don't need to do that. You basically interact through a web or app and then buy the procure the products and services. That's a huge chance. That's it's possible because of all the AI transformation happening in the, uh, the back end set of things. Um, intelligent application, you know, for example, uh, there are, if, if you take um, uh, auto, um, Tesla, or Waymo, or those sort of uh, cars, which basically have the self-drive capabilities that understands the environment it is in and able to make a decision on it. So the intelligent applications of that nature is becoming more prevalent. And the last one is business processes. Uh, when it, th this business processes is very, very key. Uh, let me take an example of uh, insurance or banking. Uh, traditionally, what would happen uh, on these two industries, a lot of manual processes are done by human beings to do finish a given set of job. For example, if you want to open a bank account, uh, you end up being, you, you submit the form to a teller, somebody and then it takes the whole set of manual processes. So all these manual processes are changing, are changed by uh, robotic process automation or robotic desktop uh, automation, which is RD and RPA. So a lot of the traditional manual process are replaced by intelligent bots. So this is the, this is, gives you overall view of the, uh, how these types of transformations happening. So let's go into how industries are reacting to this. Uh, I, I briefly touched base on the, on the manufacturing side, right? So manufacturing is one of those industries uh, which have uh, adopted technology as it needs to be in, but in this day and age, at this point in time, because of the needs and requirements of the consumers and customers are, 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 are super high, so they have to change uh, the way they're going to interact with you. First and foremost, how they engage with customers. So if you, if you are a manufacturing company, if your traditional way of engaging with the customer through you know, a manual process or you know, physical interaction, um, that's not going to be happening today moving forward because it's, the customers expect much more higher services. Uh, the second one is transformation of products. The products that you use today, the products that you have with you today, are very different products even in year, years back, right? So, so how do you transform your products? The new products are coming into marketplace. How do you uh, address the customer needs by building massively new different technology and products? Even if you take a cell phone, if you take the cell phone that you have today, it's extremely powerful than the one you had six months. That's all happening because the products are getting transformed at, at a massively high speed. And empower employees, right? So this is the whole thing, right? So decision-making decision, decision making capabilities of employees are very critical to keep you in the marketplace. So which means if you're not empowering employees to the right thing, for example, decision-making process, for ex very simple. If you're selling uh, a fridge or if you, if you are a white goods company uh, and if, you, uh, if, 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 you, if the defect is found and if the defect takes uh, our months and months to fix, you don't empower the employees, it might take years to fix. So uh, empowering employees, the right information is key. That's why the transformation is also going to come into play. The last one is op optimization oper operations, right? So if you think about uh, cost reduction, reducing costs, one way of companies do is to remove uh, all the redundant processes and processes. So uh, operations, uh, optimization is a key area where AI and machine learning can come and play a major role in that. Uh, the banking, everybody could relate to banking no matter what they do. So if you take the banking scenario, especially, uh, if you take, the, uh, if you take the, the customer service scenario, right? So the customers expect much more different services than uh, previously. For example, banks used to be only the place that you can deposit money and take money out. But as of today, there are multiple different ways the banks interact with you with different products and services. Some products are good, some products has to be uh, not that great, but depending on how, where they, how they interact, they have a, a new way of interacting with you. So that's customer relationships where you see a lot of, lot of growth. Um, risks and compliance. 
and also robotic process automation, as we briefly touched earlier, uh, optimization and, and automation of uh, manual processes using RD and RPA. There are companies like uh, Blue Prism and UiPath, which are, uh, and also Microsoft bought a company called Softonic. Um, so those are the companies which are on the cutting edge in terms of RD and RPA. The last one is uh, fraud data prevention. Because of the scale of volume of transaction that happens on the cloud, as well as the, uh, the pay online payment system, fraud detection becomes very challenging. So this is where, uh, for example, uh, if you're using a credit card and then you, you always use the credit card only in Chennai, now all of a sudden you see a credit card being used somewhere overseas, uh, the machine learning models can actually predict somebody is uh, misusing a card and then you can send a notification. Things like this in nature. So there's a whole, the banking experiences would not be the same. Uh, and that's a lot of the changes happening because of the a and ML, uh, uh, technology they use in the back end. So retail industry, uh, it's not, you don't need a lot of introduction because retail industry, as you see today, for example, the Amazons of the world, the Flipkarts of the world, have um, drastically changed how you shop, what things you buy, and how you buy it, how you interact with the products and services. Um, uh, gone are the days where you go to your shop, you go to one location in a given place, and you buy your goods and services, but now uh, it doesn't matter where you are, the goods and services comes to you as well. Uh, retail industry assist, asset nature as at this point in time is becoming really, really challenging. Um, so because uh, the, uh, if you think about uh, the real, uh, as of today, because of COVID, you can't even go to a physical store uh, because of the social distancing norms coming to play. That's where the retail industry has to change itself. It's changing itself faster. If you see in the US, uh, the number of retailers, brick and mortar retailers that gone um, down or, or, or bank, filed by bankruptcy is substantially higher. On the same time, Walmarts of the world as well as Amazons of the world have able to have a dominance because of the technological uh, power they bring in. For example, if you buy a product and then the system will automatically recommend other products that you can buy and also providing you with the options and feature sets which was not even available for example reviews you know if you want to buy a product it can give you reviews instantly see these things are making a huge differentiation in the trans retail industry uh, this is where I, I do see a lot of uh, applications of a and ml at, at, at moving moving forward there'll be much more uh well, you say usage of a and ml so now i want to give the floor to saad uh, just to briefly uh, introduce Saad, Saad is a recent uh, graduate, when I say recent, two years uh, ago. So he's also a very hands-on data scientist uh, and also data practitioner. So one key point I want to insist on this session is um, understanding about AML is one way of doing it, but getting your hands dirty, digging in and working on the actual tool sets is very, very key. I will give the floor to Saad. Um, Saad, can you take over from me and uh, and share your knowledge, please? Sure. Thanks, Krishna. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, let's get right to it. Um, in the simplest sense, machine learning is simply the process of telling a computer to do something repeatedly, right? The computer does something repeatedly, and it makes a record of each uh, time it does something and notes it down. Now, AI can be understood as a way of actually turning machine learning in, into a uh, solution that can solve a real world problem, whether it's a real world business problem or any other kind of problem. And what we're seeing now is that AI and ML is being used in the most, to solve the most challenging business problems. So for example, self-driving cars, um, credit card fraud detection, stuff that we, were, we did, could not do in an optimal way before. We can do it a lot better now because of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now, the output of machine learning and uh, machine learning models is usually in the form of classifiers, regressors, or clusters. So I'm gonna go over what the three terms mean. So classifiers, essentially, when you make a, a machine learning model to answer a question, the output would be in the form of a classifier. A classifier essentially tells you whether you can answer this question or not. That's the, just, uh, that's the most simplest way of thinking about it. A regressor establishes a relationship between a dependent variable and an independent variable. And you can have multiple independent variables that have a relationship with a dependent variable. And a cluster is simply a group of data points that have a underlying hidden pattern to them. 
Now, what are the different types of ML algorithms that you'll encounter? Now, most business products that use AI have a combination of multiple ML algorithms, right? But when you're learning about this, you want to focus on one algorithm at a time, understand how they work and really get your hands dirty with it. So on one side, you have supervised learning. What supervised learning needs at its core is labeled data. So if you have labeled data, then supervised learning is one option for an, uh, for an algorithm. And all supervised learning does is that it takes one or more independent variables and it tries to see whether you can use those independent variables to predict a dependent variable. So if you remember, you know, uh, most of you have, uh, have done some sort of linear algebra. Um, y is equal to mx plus c is a formula that we've probably heard about many times, right? You can use x to sort of predict where y is going to be. So uh, imagine you have a lot of different kinds of x's um, and uh, those would be your independent variables and you'll use them to predict y, which would be your dependent variable. Um, unsupervised learning is used when you don't have labeled data. And a really good example of this is k-means clustering. So you give a model a lot of data with many different features, and it's going to try to divide them into clusters, and each cluster, each data point in the cluster is going to sh share some sort of underlying pattern. And the interesting part about this is that if you as a human being look at the data, it will be very difficult for you to find that underlying pattern. Um, the thirdly, we have reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, what they do is they do different things multiple times and then they assess the outcome of it. So for example, let's say I create a reward function and I tell the computer to maximize the reward function for a given problem. Um, let's say this uh, model has to go to different locations, A, B, and C, and then at the end, the model gets a reward. Um, so what the model is going to do is going to go, let's say from A to B to C, and then for example, it gets a reward of five but now it goes from A to C to B, and now it gets a reward of 10. So the model is going to learn that 10 is better than five, obviously. So the optimal place to go would be A, C to B. And then it's going to keep doing this until it can get the highest reward function. So that's an example of reinforcement learning. Um, Krishna, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so uh, I wanted to explain where deep learning fits into all of this because it's a word we hear about a lot. So deep learning should be understood of as a subset of machine learning and machine learning itself a subset of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, deep learning utilizes what's called a uh, artificial neural network. And a neural network basically is designed to imitate the way a human brain works. You have multiple nodes inside a neural network that imitate neurons in the brain. And when an input comes to a deep learning model, it goes through multiple nodes within the neural network and each of those nodes signal something or look into something regarding the data. And those signals are then picked up by output nodes and the connection between the nodes are called layers. Layers can be visible or hidden. Um, Deep learning has existed actually for a long time, but now because we have a lot of increased processing power and it's available very cheaply, and because we have much better data collection methods than we had before, uh, deep learning is really something that uh, you know we're starting to utilize and really take value from. Um, uh, we're gonna uh, look into an actual real world problem uh, regarding COVID-19 um, at the end of the session. Uh, for now, I'll uh, hand over to Jaya who is a data scientist at uh, Microsoft. Seth, would you, would you like to take this or do I take it? Uh, no, you can, you can take over now. Oh, okay. So we okay. just covered most of this, yeah. Yeah, so what is that? So uh, thank you, Seth and um, Krishna. So now uh, I'll actually um, give a quick overview of what AI could actually do. So essentially what you want the computer to do is do something to enable us to, just like human beings, sense, comprehend, and act. So in terms of sense, you essentially are, you want to have uh, some sort of computer vision, audio processing technology uh, within your application so that it can automatically detect images, detect people, process 
audio to text, etc. Then you also have applications like natural language processing where you might have some Alexa or Siri device where you speak into the device, it converts it into text, could also convert it into a different language. Then in terms, uh, it could also do speech analytics. And uh, the other thing would be machine learning algorithms like recommended systems that we see on Flipkart, Amazon, and you know, uh, some sort of data visualization. So can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so now that we have a good overview of what is AI, ML, deep learning, now when you actually think of doing such AI and ML at an enterprise level, so what I mean by enterprise is companies that are small and medium, as well as large companies with more than 1,000 employees. So what we've noticed over the years is the level of maturity of how these different companies use uh, AI and ML varies by the company. And we've seen that some of them are in the beginning stage where they're trying to adopt some sort of basic analytics visualization. Some companies have a lot of data, so then they are pretty much like, we have all the data collected, can we actually build models that'll help us decide on how to increase our baseline profits? So in terms of even data that gets collected, so some companies, have their data on premise. That's on some computers on their uh, office in their office space, and others have it on the cloud. So there, there is a preference of some are not willing to put their data on the cloud. Some are willing to put it on the cloud. So based on that, also the way you kind of build your models would change. Then depending on the level of maturity of these organizations, some of them are in the initial stages where. They don't have too much of expertise on how to build these models, so they might be looking for pre-built AI models. So companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, all of them offer an entire suite of pre-built AI models. So these, these are essentially models that we've trained in-house with a huge amount of data, and then these new companies who are trying to use AI and ML can essentially just use these out-of-the-box models. Then some of the companies are more mature. They have people within the organization who know how to code in R or Python. These are the two most popular languages for data science right now. And they might actually want to do something beyond just pre-built AI models. So they, they might be like, okay, you know, I have the expertise in-house. I These pre-built models don't suit my needs. So I can actually write my own code and build my own model. So that's how some of the companies prefer to do. Then depending on how the company uh, wants to use their model, so eventually the goal of building any of these models is to finally operationalize and use it in real time scenarios. So like how Amazon or Flipkart does, when I search for a certain name of a book, it might actually give me recommendations based on how other people have looked at books. Okay, can we go to the next slide please? Thank you. So now here is how um, the underlying infrastructure works. So at least in Microsoft, this is how we have it. So we segment this into three buckets. So one is the infrastructure, one is the tooling, and one is services. So in terms of infrastructure, we essentially have a bunch of machines on the cloud or on premise, which are either CPU, GPU enabled FPGAs. And then we enable users to do AI either directly on the data on-prem, like it could be a SQL database, SQL data warehouse, data lake, Cosmos DB. So those are different levels of how much data is there. And you could actually do um, the analytics right on, uh, right where the data resides, as opposed to having to move the data to another uh, system to do any of the work. Then you also have AI compute. So we do support um, Spark, Batch AI, Data Science Virtual Machine, that is DSVM, um, Azure, uh, ACS, AKS, that's Kubernetes service, and also AI on the edge. So in terms of uh, people who are beginners and even me, what we use is we essentially have something like a data science virtual machine on the cloud, where it's all, it has all the pre-installed uh, tools that we need, like PyCharm, Jupyter Notebooks, you know, Azure Machine Learning, VS Code, and it has all these pre-built deep learning frameworks, which is cognitive toolkits, TensorFlow, Cafe, Scikit-Learn, Keras, Chain of So then, you know, I don't have to go through all the hassle of trying to install all this. 
Then in terms of services, um, like I mentioned in the previous slide, we have a whole suite of pre-built AI services. So th these are where, you know, we've actually done all the hard work, heavy lifting, we've uh, collected all the data, we've built these models. So all you've got to do is just invoke the endpoint and embed it into your application. Then in terms of custom AI, we have Azure Machine Learning, Studio, as well as Work Workbench. This is where somebody who knows a little bit of R or Python uh, can actually you know, change the input data source, do a little bit of manipulation and build the models quickly. So I'll actually go through how that gets done. And then we have the entire bot framework. We all know about chatbots. Um, when we call customer service these days, rarely do we directly get an agent. So we essentially there's a bot that interfaces between us and the agent and then you know, what's that? Uh, they kind of help streamline our query and direct us to the right agent. Next slide, please. Okay, so now let's uh, think about a total beginner. So I know that in the audience, we have people with varying level of expertise. So if you're a beginner, one of the things you want to try is try the pre-built AI. So we, uh, so I think these slides will be shared to you after the uh, talk. So we have a whole suite of pre-built AI uh, services. So to help you make better decisions, like if you have a scenario where you're trying to detect an anomaly in the data. So we have something like an anomaly detector API. So all you've got to do is just give it your data and then detect the anomaly. So you don't have to do anything with building the model. Then you could do content moderation. So supposing you don't want to actually have some offensive um, messages in your Facebook live stream or Twitter feed, you can use that. Then you have a personalizer. So this is pretty much like, okay, I want uh, my, you know, supposing someone searches for this, also recommend this. So we also have other things for language, speech, vision, web search. So this link would be available so you can go and explore. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so now um, here is a very uh, simple example of how quickly even I can use a pre-built AI. So this is our text analytics AI uh, API. So essentially what I did was I actually just went onto the website yesterday and looked for a news article. And, uh, you know, I, I have the heading of the news article, which kind of said that India becomes the 11th country to cross 100K coronavirus cases. So I was curious to see, well, what is the language, key phrase, sentiment, named entities, and linked entities. So essentially all I did was copy this line, put it into the, uh, you know, web portal, I just click on analyze and then it gives me everything. So it automatically is able to detect the language. So if I put in text in Hindi, it would be able to detect um, that the language is Hindi. It does support quite a few Indian languages, Tamil, Malayalam, et cetera. And then it, it is able to very cleverly um, extract the sentiment. So in this case, it says, well, this is a neutral. This is neither positive, negative. Then it extracts the key phrases, named entity. So named entity is interesting in a lot of scenarios where it kind of is able to say, well, this article is from a geographic location, which is for India. And the numbers that are vital in here is the 11th and the 100K use case. Can we go to the next one? Okay, so now once you kind of see that and you have a little bit of expertise in how this entire machine learning works, like how Saad said, supervised or unsupervised learning. So we have this entire very visually appealing Azure Machine Learning Studio environment. So this is an, a, a, a drag and drop environment. So essentially on the left panel, you have a bunch of different modules and on the canvas in the center, what you're gonna do is you essentially just drag and drop modules onto the canvas import your data, you can do, uh, what is that, account for missing data, you can split your data into train, test, and then build your model. So all you gotta do is just drag and drop things onto your canvas and you do it. So here's an example where this is a binary classification, like how Saad said, uh, and this is to detect cancer. So supposing you're trying to figure out, well, I have this data with a bunch of features. Does the person have cancer or not have cancer? So this could also be leveraged for the COVID scenario, where if you have a data set with a bunch of features for COVID, you can actually just essentially just replace that input, the first module for the data set and run the whole thing through. So this is reusable, very user-friendly and easy to do. Can we go to the next slide, please? 
Okay, so now here's another scenario where you're trying to figure out the sentiment of maybe it's Twitter analysis or uh, your Facebook feed. So you have your input data. Then again, all I did was just drag and drop modules from the left panel. And then I have it on my canvas. I just click the button to run. It runs. And then eventually, you know, I have this evaluate module where I can actually see the ROC curve. The higher the curve, the better. And then this is just so quick and easy. So in about, you know, five to 10 minutes, you're done with the whole thing. You have had no need to program in R or Python. But if you do know how to program in R or Python, they do have modules to execute R script, execute Python script. So as a mix to the existing modules, you can also add your custom code. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, yeah, okay, so now, um, so supposing you're a person who doesn't like the drag and drop modules and you're very good at programming, you prefer to write your own code in R or Python. So here's a notebook where um, I simply uh, have some text in Hindi and I just wanted to actually um, translate this text into let's say English. So essentially I've just written some code in here and uh, what is that? I have, so this is in Python. You can also run R code in this Jupyter notebook environment. So this is for someone who would rather have more control over what they are actually coding. So can I can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. So now, after all these different options, where you have the pre-built, you have the Azure Machine Learning Studio environment, you have the Jupyter notebook environment, and you kind of become really proficient, and you do want to actually have full control over everything, all the packages you install, everything. So you, we have something called a data science virtual machine which is actually a very nice virtual machine, which has all the deep learning tools, ML tools, visualization, data platform, development, and it supports a bunch of languages. So here you have complete control and flexibility of what you want to code and program. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, so now Saad will actually walk you through um, how we could actually use real COVID data and do some analysis. Over to you, Saad. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Krishna, do you mind if I uh, share my screen? Uh, go ahead, please. Um, can you guys see the screen? Yes, I can see it. Yeah. Great. Um, so let me just tell you what the COVID-19 open source uh, research data set challenge is. So this is a data set of essentially all the academic literature that has ever been published regarding COVID-19. So you're looking at 13 gigabytes of data, which is all basically text data in uh, the form of JSON files. And it covers, you know, data going back 20, 30 years, even the earliest published articles on COVID-19. So the, the real purpose of this data set is that you can, in a mass way, study all of that data and come up with different kinds of insights regarding what the academic consensus is regarding COVID-19. And now this is a challenge was published two months ago. It's still active. Um, you can actually see what people have submitted here. Um, if I just sort this by um, most votes, you can see other people's analysis of this data. And this is a great way for you to get exposure, right? Because this is completely free. You can download it, you can do your own data science or modeling on this, and you can publish your insights over here and you'll get a lot of exposure through this. So um, let's go over what this data looks like, right? So this is the JSON file schema. You have around about 150,000 fi files in this. And each of these files has a body text, which is the entire body of the uh, academic article. It has other metadata regarding it. Uh, for example, the title of it, the authors, the abstract. And this is the really where you'll be doing your data science or analysis. Uh, can you guys read the code? Is that legible? Yeah, I can see it actually. I great, can see it. great. Yeah, so I wanted to give you an example of how you can you know, get started with this data set. So what I'm trying to do is answer the following question, right? I want to look through every file in the data set and I want to find what are the different locations that are mentioned in it. Uh, in this case, the, the, the definition of a location is anything that is not any location that is not a country or a city. 
So for example, a continent would be a location, um, a mountain range, right, would be a location, a, uh, a river would be a location as well. So if any of those are named, we'd like to find them. So uh, let me just run you through the code. Um, so all the JSON files in the format that I showed you are stored here, uh, PDF JSON. Uh, uh, for this analysis, I'm mainly going to be using Spacey, right? Spacey is an open source uh, NLP library that any of you can download and use immediately. And in regards to Spacey, I'm actually using a pre-built model, right? So this is a deep learning model that they've already trained that is going to do this entity analysis that we want, right? So again, I'm not actually training anything or testing it. I'm, I'm just using it, right? It's already been trained and it's already been optimized. So it's really easy to get started with this. So what I do is I set a limit to 1000. Um, this means that I just want to, uh, I just want to analyze 1000 files and now understand this 1000 is uh, less than a percent of the data that is available in this data set. And um, what I'm essentially looking for is this tag um, location. Um, I won't go over exactly how the code is working, but I will show you the output. And now before we see the output, uh, you know, as a data scientist, you have to, you have to make sure that you do your data cleaning. Um, if there are any issues with the data, you clean them. I, I did some of them. For example, uh, I made sure everything was upper. So, you know, case sensitivity isn't an issue. Um, sometimes you have, for example, um, the Pacific Ocean versus Pacific Ocean, right? So if you have the in any of the names, you get rid of that. And now what I want to do is when I found all the locations for 1000 articles, I want to create a bar chart, right? So let's see how that looks. So this is the result we got. Uh, we can see that in these 1000 articles, the most mentioned location is Europe, then the Middle East, Asia, Africa. Uh, now West Nile, this is a clear issue, right? Because West Nile probably refers to the West Nile virus or the West Nile flu, um, not exactly the West Nile itself. But you can see that how this is working. And the important thing behind this is this isn't using a dictionary which has Europe or Middle East in it and extracting that. It's actually been trained to detect these locations. So there's no underlying dictionary there. Um, it's going to study not only this word alone, but it's also going to study the way it's been phrased when it's occurring. And then it's going to make a guess on whether or not this is the location. As you can see, this Vero is probably not a location. That's also an error. So you are going to get issues with it, but overall you'll see that a lot of this is correct. And again, uh, you can go to Spacey's documentation. There are many different tags, right? There are tags for persons, there are tags for countries, um, there are tags for quantities and you can use that to really uh, analyze all the text data very quickly. Great. Krishna, um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. Thank you. Let me take it over. Thanks. So thank you, uh, Jaya and Saad. So now we will get in, and thanks for the uh, detailed explanation of the COVID-19 data set. It's fantastic. I learned a couple of new things in it. So, so now I'm going to go more into the prospects, the job prospects, um, the things uh, that are, how do you, what, where the industry is going forward, what sort of potential career opportunities you can, um, you can, we can um, build on on AI and ML. So I'm just I shared a couple of Gartner reviews. So uh, so the first one is talks about um, the average. If you see that number 2020, 2022, this is pre-COVID data, but uh, the number of organizations that are looking to uh, implement or adopt uh, AML projects is substantially has going to increase. So in terms of if you see 2019, it's just just four percent. Now it's in 2022 the production is about 35%, right? So which means there's a huge jump in that. Um, and also the second uh, graph, this graph is about uh, um, the job, number of jobs, AI jobs that are posted in the top 12 GDP countries. So uh, in, in this scenario, if you see the, the light blue, which is the business area and the dark blue is the IT department. But traditionally AI and ML and all those sort of uh, 
uh, technologies are being predominantly IT based. But as I explained to you on the first three slides about industry changing or adopting new AI and ML practices, um, the job growth on the non-IT space for AI and ML is substantially higher and is going to increase more and more. If you just look at the number 2015, 2019, and if you look at you know, the latest numbers, there's a huge demand for the, for the, uh, the type of skills AI and ML people are going to bring in. I will go into a bit more deeper on that. So, so if you think about, you know, um, so uh, what are the jobs, you know? So if you think about pure uh, title-based job classification, they're looking at data scientists is one way. Um, a data scientists have got different skill set too. You know, you, you need to have um, higher math and higher statistics as well as, uh, uh, you know, much more on that side. And also machine learning engineer where uh, Asad was showing, right? So he, he used Python as a tool. Uh, so he would be, we classify him as, uh, as one of the engineers where he's going to build machine learning models as well as all, uh, use coding to interact with it. And obviously research scientists um, and also pure business intelligence developer, like if you see any guts, all the other visual representation and things like that, um, BI there. Within, there are other roles within that particular ecosystem, right? Uh, a developer, like Saad is, uh, is a full stack uh, data engineer as a developer. He can work on the, when I say full stack, he can work on the front end layer, he can work on the middleware, as well as he can work on the back end data side, side too, right? And architects like me. I don't design uh, full time on 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 the AI animal architect, but I do have a generic design on the en enterprises. A data analyst, a data warehouse engineer, uh, traditional uh, data warehousing on the on the on the cloud, and product managers. Product managers are companies uh, which are building products. Uh, if you take uh, if you take just on the South India itself, you will see companies like Zoho uh, or Freshworks. So these are product companies, and the large ones like Microsoft, Salesforce. You know, every single company that Google, every every single products you interact with are basically have some sort of product manager. And front-end developers are classic people that build UI, but they work with the backend data sources. Uh, I really wanted to go into deep into uh, bills. And when I say verticals, uh, okay, I'm, I'm a finance professional. I, I know I do, I'm doing commerce. I'm doing, you know, uh, uh, finance sort of areas. Within that, there are multiple different types of roles, which is portfolio, algorithm trading, fraud detection, the list goes on. Even if you, like, for example, if you're doing economics, you know, um, there are things which in uh, economics scenario where economists are using uh, big data, uh, volume, volumes of data to make a lot of decisions on the economic growth. And the last one is manufacturing, uh, if building predictive maintenance, workflow, product automation, quality control, supply chain optimization. This just three industries. If you take the entire industry spectrum, there are multiple different variations of the roles specific to the industry um, that is going to make uh, the ANML a must have skill in those industries too. So uh, uh, retail, that is, if you take oil and gas, if you take, uh, you know, uh, the list goes on. So this is just to give you, when you talk about AML, it's just not IT related, it's also industry related too. So um, the reason I, I want to, quickly touch base on the scale and the volume of data and engineering on available on this one. Uh, if you, pretty much everybody knows Tesla is the electric car. As of, uh, if, you see, if you see the, the autopilot, autopilot is where the, the, the car is basically able to drive itself. It's, it's crossing about 4 billion miles, okay? So if you think about 2015, I, they were just on the early stage, they are in million, now they have 4 billion miles of data collected and they're using these data to build new generation cars and things like that. I really want you uh, to go, I collected, I shared two YouTube links. It's from the data scientists from Tesla. The amount of engineering is going into it, it's, it's massive. And what you also get at this day and age is, all this information is available to you as a student in YouTube to go and learn it. So it was that's where uh, data and um, knowledge uh, liberalization is happening. Where you don't need to uh, go and search. You just have a, if you have YouTube, you can actually start picking up these ideas, right? Um, the reason I bring I bring in specifically to Tesla is a lot of the AI and machine learning models, a lot of engineering which Tesla is doing on the on the on the building the the electric car is available for you to read which is unprecedented in any human history where um, the amount of knowledge company like Tesla sharing for everybody 
is huge i really want the students to take advantage of that um and for the reading right so uh, the reason i just want to start with uh, ray dalio um it's just it's not about ai and ml or anything else he just explains to you how the economy works the reason i put that in so right now we are a lot of countries are going to recession there will be like a bit of a negative sentiment across the industry um but i really want you guys to take a look at the how the economy works because it's going to give you some insights much more deeper insights that help you to frame your mindset as well as frame your career in much positive way and uh, there are a couple of books like uh, the man who saw the market it's by the, the jim simmons is a, is a mathematician and crypto uh, cryptographic analyst so he ran, he runs a company called uh, um, specifically doing on the stock market analysis he basically used data and machine learning models to beat the market for 30 40 years in in a, in, a, in a consistent fashion the reason i'm saying that is it's going to give you some new insights uh, how uh, people people have used uh, the machine learning and and the computer algorithms and and, and the artificial intelligence to build something very unique value this uh, this fantastic book i definitely recommend you read it and again go back to uh, ray dalio so if you want to learn about uh, ai in ml the the certified author is andrew ning so andrew is one of the best teachers you can find on the entire planet uh, i'm not you, you go to his youtube videos he he's the founder of coursera and other uh, other uh, other uh, uh, companies the way he explains a and ml is it's one of the best in the world uh, he is one of the best teachers so if you if you want to think you know what should i have to go and learn it i think andrew ning will be one of the uh, teachers i think you should follow and the last one is uh, as sad mentioned the other challenge there's a waymo open data set challenge waymo is another car company based in us they do post lots and lots of challenges for anybody to solve and the world bank has opened up all his data to the world uh, so these are the things i really would help you to uh, make your uh, get you more knowledge on these ones so that you can be uh, successful in a career so the last one is uh, okay what are the skills that you need to be on the ai ml career the first and foremost the number one uh, irrespective of what you do is at least you should have some good understanding of python or pandas or tensorflow or spark so these are tools that you able to use to wrangle the data massage the data get things done so that's a one of the uh, so fundamental at the very basic level you need to have the second one is uh, theory so uh, um, so just to stress the key point the things that you read on the books about machine learning ml are very very important because a lot of this is like uh, learning about a theorem or 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 theory or something which is already uh, documented um uh, reading course material reading is absolutely important for this one uh, if, if you take jaya she uh, one of the things she mentioned is she constantly reads every single day to keep her updated on this one so fund the foundations on algebra mathematics linear it help, would be help, very helpful um and also statistics because a uh, lot of these things you do are uh, statistical analysis and domain level knowledge so this is where you are so for example if you are doing um, i'm just throwing example like if you are a mechanical uh, engineer or if you are working on the economics if you are working on finance if you are working on chemistry chemistry so those domain level knowledge knowledge are must have uh, because that's where you're going to apply your ai and ml skills to make something more tangible the last one is uh so you need to able to have uh, able to uh, merge your 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 theoretical skills from the courseware and your programmatic skills based on your own experience and your domain knowledge uh, in the end you come up with something fascinating or uh, something fascinating so these three are the five skills i would say that you require um i got you you know what hey you know what i don't know where to start you know so we have a full uh, uh, journey course where we can start from nothing to something so i shared that links on this one as well um there are we have a couple of useful links and stuff so i know we just over the time but 10 o'clock so i really want to uh, thank uh, george and team uh, as well as shri priya to give us opportunity to come and share the knowledge uh, and then also uh, you know we are looking forward to answer any questions you might have uh, i believe i want to give the floor floor back to shri priya uh, and george so that they can take it up but thanks for the opportunity uh, saad and jaya do you want to share some uh, some of your uh, thoughts on this please 
Sure. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah. we had a great presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks to the organizers and uh, everyone. Uh, this is a great and very interesting topic. And I know a lot of, there's a lot of interest here. And uh, I really hope you guys uh, took something useful from it. Likewise, yeah. thank you. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And thank you to the organizers for coming up with the webinar idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Shibriya and Josh. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Shibriya, ma'am, I would request you to just take it over. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Sadhan. Thank you, Jaya. Mr. Suhail, sir, you can just proceed with the Q&A session, sir. Uh, good evening to one and all present here. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to express my heartfelt thanks to our eminent speakers for our webinar, Mr. Krishna, Cloud Architect, Microsoft Canada, Mr. Saad Malik, Full Stack Data Scientist, Director of Technology, Software Canada, and Ms. Jaya Matthew, Senior Data Scientist, Microsoft Azure IA Canada, uh, for uh, providing us a wonderful, informative, fascinating, and collaborative session. And uh, really, it was a wonderful session to be honest. Now, uh, the, uh, now we'll move on to the question answer session. The first question uh, from a participant: What are the courses at graduate and postgraduate level are available to make a career in AI? Jaya, do you want to just take a stab at it? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, at least from the experience that I have, what I've noticed is, um, as an undergraduate, uh, it's it's always good to have some sort of coursework in um, some statistics, economics. Then, computer science is important just because we all uh, even though you know I have uh, what's that all data scientists would need to code like Saad says and Python R as well as I think um, a strong understanding of some mathematical concepts just because all these statistical algorithms tend to be mathematically heavy so it's good to know what what actually happens behind the code so just running the code is easy but then interpreting the results is something that you need so I would say the, uh, the the background that you need is some amount of statistics, economics, math, computer science. Uh, the next question from a participant is: What are the skills that are needed to be to, to become a data scientist? So I think I think again. Uh, so. Uh, uh, I guess I'll take that again. So I think the skills, like I said, in terms of coursework, that's there. And I think if you think of day-to-day um, -day working of a data scientist, um, yes, building the models uh, is important. However, you also need to have some soft skills. So you need to be able to interact with the business and other teams to convey and explain what this model means in layman's terms. So that, that is important. Then you also need to be able to work in a team because just as a day is so typically the teams I work with on a day to day basis is not just me. So there is obviously data engineer, there is an architect, then there is a project manager, there are leads. So, you know, you have to liaison between all these people, the business groups, as well as your end customer. And the next question, uh, how does a assist in linguistic and language learning. Are there are any risks or challenges with this? Okay, uh, I guess I can take. Uh, yeah, please. Yes. Oh, okay, I'll take it. So I think in terms of uh, this is uh, NLP, the domain of NLP, isn't it? Yeah. So interestingly, you bring up this question because yeah, I think some of the projects I'm working on is all just NLP, and I think NLP has gained a lot of traction just because of all these uh, you know speech devices, Alexa. Google Home, you know, and all this. So I think in terms of devices and uh, capability, we've noticed a lot of issues when it comes to dialects, as well as when it comes to understanding different accents. So for, for example, in, with respect to Indian languages, we at Microsoft, we have our entire teams actually based out of uh, Hyderabad, India. And we have them specialize in Indian languages. So what we've noticed is India has so many languages. And even if you think of one language like Hindi, the way it's spoken across different parts of India is very different. So hence, uh, we actually do run into issues with dialects and the way it's spoken. So when we actually automatically capture uh, speech to text, we see a lot of discrepancy in the transcription. 
So I think we need a lot of training data and get all this representative data to actually build it. So, and then even in terms of translation, so if you kind of look at uh, even Bing Translator, Google Translator, sometimes we um, kind of put a native language either in Tamil, Telugu, Hindi, and you know if you look at the translated text in English, it doesn't always make sense. So obviously there's a lot of work in progress. This, these are active areas of research actually. Yeah, let me add a bit to that. Um, there's a huge gap in you know the data that is available regarding NLP uh, when it comes to English and everything else, right? So an area that uh, someone can explore is you know local languages developing the corpus for that, so that data scientists can actually create um, NLP models using that data. So there's a lot of potential for growth there. Uh, the next question: uh, uh, MSN has replaced journalist with AI. What's your view on this move? If, whether it is a boon or a ban? Personally, I believe journalists, good ones, will report things well, opposed to AI. Adanja, I know you guys are the experts on it. I mean, this is again. Um, specific yeah. Way. So maybe I, I take a stab and then Sal will say his point of view. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Sure. So, okay. So I think, I think, yeah, even I kind of, uh, yeah, some of my family members actually sent me this uh, article that uh, Microsoft's going to replace journalists with AI tools. So, I mean, I, I really think that we, uh, you know, the quality of journalism will obviously be more automated if we use uh, AI and ML. And I do not think we're at that level where we'll be completely able to replace a journalist because I, I think, Based on my experience, what I've seen is, yes, we have text summarization. So I think an, another active area of research in NLP is text summarization. So that's very useful. So in the sense that, you know, I mean, you have this huge article or this oh, huge... So essentially, you, you're trying to actually do either... Well, I think there's... Some... I think... Uh... Jay, you can continue. I think uh, somebody oh, okay. unmuted. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. So then I think essentially, so like I said about uh, text summarization, so you can either do abstractive or extractive summarization. So abstractive is where you simply like take some part of the article and then that's a summary, which is which is easier to do. But extra, uh, what's that? Yeah, uh, I think I mixed it up. So it's extractive and abstractive. So if you want to actually summarize an article just using AI and ML, the quality of summarization is just not of the level of a human. So I think there's still a lot more work to be done, a lot more tweaking of algorithms, hyperparameters, and I think we still have a long way to go before we completely replace humans in a lot of these jobs. And I would kind of say that in terms of even um, most of the work we do, although we do uh, automated predictive maintenance and other things for energy and all the other companies, there's always a human in the loop. So we've not been able to completely replace the human. So that's my point of view. So Saad, over to you. Yeah, I completely agree with that. So you might see tools in the future that have really advanced uh, predictive text features. So they might make it easier for a journalist to write an article. Um, they, you know, they can really easily put something together like a paragraph of text. But in the end, you will still need an actual journalist to uh, correct any issues with it or sign off on it. So I don't think uh, a whole journalist can be replaced by a computer at this stage. Uh, the next question, how is AI is used in education sector? Maybe I'll, I'll take a stab and then Jaya and then Mara Saad, you can, uh, you, can, you can continue that, right? So I think I, I do see uh, from my view, there are a couple of areas which is uh, AI is being used. Uh, uh, so once uh, one such, uh, uh, when you call about reinforced learning, right? So I know previously there are, like if you take things like, uh, there are a lot of tools available where it will help you to find out your gaps in your, in your knowledge and understanding, right? So there's a thing called, uh, there's, a, there's a Swiss cheese, uh, uh, challenge where uh, most people would have gaps on the learning in some areas, but it's very hard for them to understand what are the gaps. So this is where uh, the AI and ML can actually, if you, if you take a, a test of some sort, you can find out uh, where are the gaps in your knowledge understanding and it can, and it can help you to guide you, uh, hey, you, these are the areas you should work. So there are things like, uh, if you look at uh, the apps like Anki, A-N-K-I, 
which also helps you. For example, you can put in a couple of questions where, or, or quizzes where you can you can take these quizzes consistently. It's going to help you define the gap. So that that's from the user user perspective. But apart from that, a lot of the training courses, a lot of the uh, new way of teaching things, it also has got both AI and ML embedded into it. Uh, for example, uh, there are new uh, test scenarios where um, the more uh, you you take the particular subject, uh, the questions are going to get more harder and harder. Like that's what could be a adaptive test. Most of the GMAT and SAT and a lot of the new tests are using that as well. Um, um, and also, uh, based on a lot of the training we do today at Microsoft, it also based on the role that you have, uh, AML can be used to, uh, to personalize your education to what you need. Um, there are a lot of new uh, innovations happening on that perspective. We see, uh, especially on the K, K1 to K12 education system these days, uh, a lot of the, uh, the kids are starting to do uh, different use cases and courses based on ANML. So Jay and Saad, uh, you can you want to uh, you know add some color to that in terms of uh, how actually being used, models used to? Yeah, I'll, um, I think I'll add a few things. So I actually used to work at a uh, ed tech firm as my first job as a data scientist. And um, the biggest issue with a traditional classroom environment is that you don't have a lot of data collection methods regarding student performance. So you could have something like attendance, you could have a performance in, ex in an exam and stuff like that. But now with online learning, you have an immense amount of data collection that's possible. So if a student is learning, let's say uh, by reading an ebook, you can collect the uh, data regarding how much they interact with that ebook, how much it's time they spend on a specific chapter and all of that. And then you could using data of previous students who've either done successfully or not done successfully, you can actually start predicting which students are going to have trouble in the future. And then a professor can actually go and give those students more attention or solve uh, academic issues sort of before they show up. So now with online learning uh, being a lot more prominent, uh, I think you'll see a lot of benefit in the, uh, um, for, for uh, ML and AI in the ed tech sector. Jaya? Yeah. yeah, I think uh, so this is brilliant. I think what uh, Krishna as well as uh, Saad said, so I think the only additional point of view that I have is, I think now when we think of um, users for any software or any tool that we build with AI and ML, one of the biggest aspects we at Microsoft do focus on is people with disability. So there are people with um, difficulty who have difficulty in reading, writing, eyesight, speech. So you know we we do try and embed all our technology to cater to everyone irrespective of any underlying disability or condition. So I think that's going to be a very big focus in pretty much everything. So even when it comes to school and i think i i grew up in a very traditional school setting where there was a classroom the teacher taught in a certain way that had to cater to an average student so there are obviously kids who do above average below average so i think with ai and ml we'd actually be able to help people who do need a little more time and effort to understand study as well as cater to the high achievers by giving them more challenging things. So I think one of the first steps, like how Krishna said is the computer adaptive testing that we have for the uh, CAT, the GMATs, the GREs, SATs, TOEFLs. So I think that's one step. And I think a lot more things will go in that direction. Thank you. Just want to, that's a very good question. You know, so I just want to add one more thing with Jaya brought a very key point. Um, people with different abilities, right? So, uh, so for example, a uh, few years ago, when you build an application or software or services, uh, it was this, and it might not have the features and functionality that is for people that are probably, let's say, colorblind, right? For example, so these, uh, so we, they can't see different shapes and colors and stuff like that. So these days, because we're using a lot of model DPC, if you, if you take the latest it's a Microsoft Office. It has got so much inbuilt into it where um, the people with different abilities are able to have the same experience, you know? So same thing as Jay mentioned, the, the learning uh, challenges, you know, some kids would have different challenges on various areas. See that area itself on its own, it's a huge area, which I think it's going to grow more and more than anything else because um, everybody wants to learn, everybody wants to contribute. And that's the area which is actually, personally, that's one of my passions as well, where 
uh, I am doing some lot of readings on it. So that's a very good area to to go and grow and more. Uh, yeah, that's a fantastic question, by the way. And the last question. Other questions are good too. This, this is very good. So this also, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the last and the uh, last question. I know that machine learning models are now being used in computer-aided drug designing to fasten up the drug designing industry. What are the other scope of AI in infectious diseases like, for example, COVID? How can AI benefit COVID eradication? It's between you guys and Jaya and uh, Saad. I think you can you can take a stab at that too. Yeah, sure. I'll uh, I'll try my best with this. So. Um, you know, uh, like I said, the biggest benefit of um, AI and data science in this regard is that you can do process a series of processes very quickly that previously uh, took very long. So like I said, if you wanted to review, like the data set that I showed you, if you wanted to review all the academic literature uh, regarding a topic, you could do that in a traditional way where you would get a group of researchers who would actually read the papers and derive insights from it. But now you're using it, uh, you're doing that using a, um, a machine learning a learning algorithm. So you can get to the end result a lot quicker than you could before. Um, so that's like the main advantage I would say in this regard. And uh, again, um, we also saw some models that analyzed chest x-rays and made a prediction um, regarding COVID-19 uh, using image analysis. So you might have that avenue as well where uh, you can explore. But the biggest change is, again, there's doing something a lot quicker that previously took a lot of time. Jia, do you want to add something to that? Yes, yes. I think that's perfect. So I think the example that Saad said about chest x-rays, and I think we all know that with COVID, people end up actually having, uh, you know, a lot of congestion in their chest. And if we can kind of just uh, auto detect, you know, based on, you know, images, that that's one of the things. And then so another one of the things that we at Microsoft are doing is essentially, um, um, so like, uh, Kaggle has opened up this huge data set. So there's a huge corpus of research data that all these researchers and scientists need to pass through and see. And it's humanly impossible for anybody to kind of try and find the needle in the haystack. So essentially what we have is something called, um, you know, Azure search pipelines. So essentially what we do is we just, um, parse all these documents irrespective of format, be it an image, uh, was a PDF, Word, Excel. So we pass it through these huge pipelines where essentially all different formats of images gets cracked in this cracking pipeline and all the text and everything from the image gets very intelligently abstracted and it's, it's in a text format. So now in the, so then what we typically do is we just, um, take this text that gets extracted from these documents and then we can do named entity recognition like how SARS says so where's this document from does this document have something related to SARS does this have something with uh, the Nile virus West Nile virus or does it have anything with COVID so then you know it can help us get patterns out of it and in fact I think if you think of all the companies I think Microsoft being one of them We've actually given so many of our huge cloud data centers and we're actually giving priority to um, scientists in these academic institutes for all our computing cores, CPU, GPU machines. So they actually get priority over us. I think NHS in the UK and uh, you know places in Dubai for schooling, everything. So we actually give um, priority so that these researchers can run their huge sequencing uh, workloads on our cloud computing platform. So that's all I had actually. Uh, thank you speakers for your uh, question and answer session. Now, uh, as far as the participants are concerned, kindly look into the chat box for the feedback link. Uh, kindly provide the feedback link uh, to get the certificates. And uh, now let me hand over the session to Dr. Sri Priya. Yes, sir. Thank you to all the wonderful speakers. Your presentation has got a lot of insight and hope students, this will be a good start for you. Thank you all. With this, we end this session. Stay safe. Thank you once again. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all. Thanks very much for attending. I appreciate Thanks, everyone. it. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. Wonderful session. Thank you so much. Thanks.